lot of um, growth, disruption, and change. And as you look at the big picture trends that you've seen over the last three years, um, what 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 have they been? Share with us, please. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I would start with uh, understanding the evolution of AI, which started really at around 1950s and uh, to today. And throughout this timeline, AI has really evolved through various uh, technical paradigms. Mm -hmm. uh, it has started with rule-based systems to statistical learning and to deep learning approaches. And the field in general has witnessed uh, periods of excitement, a lot of progress, a lot of hype, and um, uh, a lot of skepticism as well. Just to give you a feel for what has been happening uh, uh, before we get into what is gonna happen, in the last few years, uh, uh, there is some wins basically that brought AI forward. For example, the IBM Watson's winning the Jeopardy in 2011 was a watershed moment showcasing that AI has the ability to process as un and understand human language in a big way. Or in 2014, uh, realistic images and content was generated by uh, generative, uh, the beginning of generative AI algorithms. And then in 2016, AlphaGo, which is a AI uh, uh, application, was able to defeat the world champion of Go player that demonstrates AI's uh, capability in complex games. So then started in 2017, things started to move really fast and expanded rapidly into many fields, including self-driving cars, virtual uh, assistants, medical uh, diagnosis and natural language processing. So I would say that in the past five years, the uh, evolution of AI has taken on a new slope, very fast explosion of innovation, and especially in the area of large language models. And this is being enabled by advances in hardware, availability of larger scale data, and improvements in the algorithms. So in my view, I put the evolution of AI in uh, two periods, pre-2017 period, where there was a lot of uh, technical developments, uh, but not much of a fanfare. And then post-2017, where the explosion of innovations and new applications have occurred. So that brings us to present and I uh, can talk about where uh, we are going uh, at this point or at the later point, uh, as you would like, Len. Very interesting to hear the timeline. Um, I was taking notes of what you were saying. Um, thank you for that. I, I also would like to hear from Denka in terms of the big tr picture trends that you're seeing in this space and, and how that has you know, impacted you and your practice. Absolutely. Yeah, we've, we've actually recently released a, a digital thought leadership report where we describe five shifts to digital personalized healthcare. This is obviously a life sciences perspective, but I thought it's, it's very interesting and relevant to this topic. So the, the most significant shifts that our senior contacts in the space predict are uh, from silent patient to smart patient. Um, so this is the opportunity for a patient to create data, provide feedback, and to interact with their own health, 
health in a different way uh, that will sort of allow a new level of patient centricity and, and, and personalized treatments. Uh, uh, the other one was from open loop to, to closed loop, uh, which is about closing the loop between the patient and the health system, um, uh, which has the potential to transform the patient experience and, and move from a, a reactive and uh, generic health experience to a more pr pr proactive and engaged one. Uh, the other one was from sick care to health care. So this is obviously about preventative uh, medicine, preventative care. So moving people from engaging with health services at a point of critical need to in, in engaging with their health on a daily basis, really. And, uh, and here I actually wanted to mention a fun set of studies that came out when Pokemon Go was launched in uh, 2016 where it was sort of uh, discussed whether this could be a, a successful digital therapeutics. Because uh, there were specific studies uh, at the time, nothing long, longer term, uh, but the, these, the studies show that actually the VR game, Pokemon Go, added to added like over 100 million steps to US activity in the summer of 2016, reduced sedentary behavior by 30, 30 minutes per day, increased exercise of dedicated players by 26%, uh, reduced psychological distress in adults and improved social connectedness and improved intelligence in cognitive performance in teenagers, which I thought is quite, uh, quite cool. Uh, but uh, yeah, the other one was uh, the, the shift from fragmented platforms to personal platforms, uh, which is obviously a tricky topic, especially within healthcare due to the sensitivity, uh, sensitivity and complexity of uh, of the data, uh, among other uh, other sort of issues. But here, um, another sort of uh, side note: we ask the leaders in the space um, the following question, uh, and I'll, I'll read it aloud if that's okay. So, if Google knew I had high blood pressure and was twenty to thirty pounds overweight and used maps navigate to a fast food outlet at 10 p.m., would it also be helpful to challenge the user on that decision based on their health? And wow. the, the overriding answer was yes, but only if I choose what I share. So that's just uh, food for thought. Uh, but I thought it's quite interesting. Um, one. interesting. Quite yeah, interesting and the last one is from centralized healthcare to decentralized healthcare. So the delivery of healthcare is still a primarily centralized uh, appointment-based and clinical administrative model, although lots has been done thanks to COVID. But this is where digital health companies can disrupt. So that's my perspective. And incredible. I mean, I, I think your comment about uh, AI uh, being proactive and engaging uh, puts a whole different spin on you know, the fear of AI when, when actually it can be proactive and engaging. We're going to go now to the next section, which is positioning yourself for AI and data science roles. Um, so Charlie, starting off with you, uh, what sort of roles are you filling at a leadership level for AI and uh, data science? Yeah, Lynn, it's um, it's a really interesting landscape. You know, we're sort of like in, I, I think about it uh, as, as sort of being like right in that, um, that archetypal moment of the inchworm where all the stuff that Rosada is just talking about, artificial general intelligence, you know, all this really exciting R&D work that's happening around AI, in reality is, you know, not really being deployed in the vast majority of companies. And there, and, and so if you think about, you know, if you're, if you think about what are the roles in data and data science and AI in most organizations, um, what we see is that our clients are trying to, you know, close any sort of gap between what's possible today, you know, the stuff that's happening in an R&D lab at a Google or, or a Facebook or, you know, a major academic center and, you know, the reality on the ground that they're still running the business the same way that they were in 1980, effectively, right? Um, and so... Um, 
you know, you, you have seen as a, as a sort of an initial reaction to this over the last five years, the role of the chief data and analytics officer has really sort of cemented itself on most executive leadership teams. If you look at the Fortune 500 and beyond, typically it's reporting either to a CEO or some other executive committee member at this point. Um, and it sort of mirrors, right, what we've seen like in the past generation with technology leadership. You know, it was that each individual business area was kind of developing its own tech and eventually realized that it made sense to have more strategic oversight for tech and now data and analytics as an enterprise asset. Um, <clears throat> what that means, you know, is also that in terms of creation of roles, there's this chief data and analytics officer but we're really seeing this sort of fleshing out and normalization of like, what are the enterprise data and analytics roles underneath that? And so you're getting to these more focused, um, you know, divisionally, like if you're in a large enterprise, divisionally focused data roles, which are typically more about delivery and execution and proven value creation in a specific business area or domain, or about transformation of some business process. Um, or other specialized domains like data product is a big job, right? We've all realized that like, if you just have a bunch of data scientists doing experiments with your data, but you don't have a product approach to thinking about, well, where is the real business need, right? What, are we, what is our strategic business objective? What's the roadmap that we're investing behind? You end up with a lot of like, experiments that don't really go anywhere or add up to very much. And so that kind of product leadership for data is big. Um, data engineering is a huge deal right now for most organizations, because in order to get to utilizing, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning use cases, typically your, your bigger deficit is gonna be that you don't have the right data or the best data at the right time in the right place, less so than your ability to model on that data, right? With cloud computing, it's a lot easier to, you know, take models that have already been developed off the shelf and, you know, and get 80% of the way there towards personalization or pricing algorithms, things like that. Um, it's that, you may not have the data actually in the place or, or way that you need it to be able to do that work. So those, those types of jobs at the level down are a big deal right now. Um, we are seeing lots of like distinct head of AI roles cropping up. So this sort of separation of what we, you know, Ryan and I used to call like the kind of data science, AI, like everything bucket into more of a traditional data science and machine learning. and like real, you know, generative AI work because of the differences in terms of how that's getting deployed and the way that you're deploying it through organizations. Um, so that's a big deal. And, you know, and in general, I think the people taking the jobs, like 10 years ago when we were doing this work, lots of the people taking the senior jobs were more generalists who kind of had an analytical orientation and understood the business, or maybe in some cases, like, the PhDs who were just like real, real, you know, machine learning experts or AI experts. But now we're sort of seeing more of the leaders be somewhere in the middle. And as the focus shifts towards actually getting value out of this stuff, you need this kind of broad based, like actual depth in algo development, but also data engineering, but, you know, all these sort of disciplines. And then proven experience actually deploying use cases through various parts of your business and taking the lead on stuff like culture change, taking the lead on stuff like org transformation, right? Versus just being the person modeling the world and hoping people will pay attention to the insights, really driving people to behave differently and make decisions differently. Mm -hmm.